overflow of the western sky comes Sky King. America's favorite flying cowboy. Well, hello there. We're going to start out this video today in the corner on the deck. And uh, let me show you something what the wife bought me. She bought me a couple of scrub brushes. She says the deck is looking kind of, just kind of ratty. She wants the deck cleaned up. So, <laughs> it'll have to wait for a while, but I guess I'm going to have to do it. She got the buckets and all the other crap to go with it, so... She said, she said the corner on the deck here is looking really mangy. We did a little bit of scrubbing the other day to take off some of the mold, but, you know, it's... Personally, I don't care either way. <laughs> it's no big deal to me, but she wants it clean, so guess what? We're going to have to clean it. But we won't be able to do it until uh, after the end of next week. Today is the uh, 8th of June, and uh, we have to head up next Tuesday morning to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. My second oldest grandson is graduating from Army Basic Training up there. His uh, brother uh, graduated from Air Force Basic Training, and I put up a couple of videos about that a while back. So I kind of hope to do the same thing at Fort Leonard Wood. I've, I've never been to Fort Leonard Wood, so it's, I'm really looking forward not only to, to going to his graduation, which is fantastic, I think, uh, I'm also looking forward to going to Fort Leonard Wood and looking around, you know, checking the place out. So that's what's uh, on the agenda for the next week. Uh, there won't be any videos or anything like that while I'm gone. But this video, I wanted to tell you something, uh, especially the young people out there who, or those who have not ever worked on an old vintage radio or worked on an old vintage television, and you're thinking about doing it. It's very important to get all your documentation, I've already told you that in previous videos, you know, your schematics and your parts list and all that stuff. Uh, but it's also extremely important to get a mentor, a mentor. Ham radio uh, operators, when uh, they are becoming a ham, uh, when they get their license and all that stuff, they buddy up with someone who's very, very experienced, and it's called an Elmer. Uh, the ham radio community calls them an Elmer. Uh, in, in our uh, uh, radio and TV restoration type stuff, we'll call them a mentor. And you don't want somebody, you know, who's just sort of piddled around with radios. And you don't want to depend on, on like YouTube videos uh, or just books or lessons uh, to teach you how to uh, restore uh, vintage electronics and there's a reason for that because if, if you do something wrong you're going to die there is enough voltage and in, certainly enough current in these radios to kill your butt so find a mentor who for many years uh, has both talked the talk and walked the walk you don't want someone who's really not experienced. Now this is the guy you can call on, send him emails, call him up uh, and ask him questions if you're not sure about something and he has the answer every time. Or he knows exactly where to go to get the answer for you if it's you know kind of new to him. Because we new guys we can come up with some crazy questions sometimes and uh, things that other people take for granted who are experienced in the electronics field uh, we know nothing about it so we come up with some off-the-wall stuff. So, find someone who's qualified. It doesn't matter where it's at. Qualified. Qualified to be your mentor in any kind of electronic, vintage electronics uh, uh, repair and restoration endeavor. Now, I want you to meet the mentor that I have selected for this TV restoration project. His name is Brendan, B-R-E-N-D-A-N. And there's a handsome devil standing there in front of his charcoal grill. 
And Brandon, he spotted my first YouTube video when I purchased this television. And he immediately contacted me and said he offered his help. He said, you know, I, I've done this for quite a while. And if there's anything you need help on, you let me know. He said, I'm very familiar with those old RCA television sets. Well, you know, we exchanged a few emails. And I'll tell you what, uh, the information he's provided and the conversations we've had, this fella right here does know uh, vintage televisions. So I told him I was going to go ahead and make him my mentor, uh, official mentor, and I was going to uh, say so in a YouTube video, and I was going to put a picture up where everybody could see his handsome face. And he, he wrote back and he said, uh, I'll just read you what he said. Get this paper squared away here. He said, thank you for your vote of confidence. I'll try to live up to it. I live just outside of Detroit, Michigan, and as I told you before, I'm an old semi-retired guy. TV sets were the computers of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. That set was actually quite expensive at the time it was purchased, if you compare it as a percentage of the guy's salary that originally bought it. I worked in this business in its heyday when people were willing to spend money to have these sets repaired. I was the youngest licensed TV serviceman in Detroit at 17. I worked in the service shop of a company that had several branches around the city and both sold and serviced televisions. The place was called Modern Television. It was a production shop. That means get them in and get them out. And did the service for all the branches. Because I was young, I didn't get to do much field work. Uh, we called those guys tube jockeys because, it was, uh, because if there was a real problem, they brought it back to the shop for us bench men. Most of that was jealousy because we worked on a flat rate and they worked on commission and made more money than we did. However, for the most part, the benchmen had to be sharper because when it came into the shop, something seriously wrong uh, was with the TV. Or something was seriously wrong with the TV. And then he, uh, he says, enough reminiscing, uh, get to work. If you have a question, don't be afraid to ask. Are we about to crash? So we go to the lift gas we use. What's that? Stall warning, don't worry about it. I'm running on as lean a mixture as I dare. Guy, we're nearly out of gas. You know, it wasn't long before I had to call on my old buddy Brendan for some expertise. Uh, in the process of checking out all the co I checked out every coil in this chassis. I spent a couple of days doing it. And I do the same thing in a radio. Check out your coils first. If your coils are no good, there's no sense in spending any more time and energy on it until you get those coils replaced or repaired. So I checked out every coil on this chassis to include the power transformer, uh, this transformer here, and that's in the choke, of course. That's, I owned that out as part of it. But while I was at it, I also checked out the, the two selenium rectifiers. And lo and behold, when I compared them to the schematic right here, this power transformer, these two selenium rectifiers, this choke, which is that thing right there, and the two electrolytic capacitors, which would be this one and this one underneath, these two silver cans, they all work together to form the B-plus voltage. And when I checked these two selenium rectifiers out, I found that they were wired backward. I said, what the heck is going on here? These things are wired backward. Uh, and and I, I couldn't understand that. So I looked at it two or three times, and I said, why on earth? I said, you know, it's possible some technician changed these, which he did uh, in March 8th, 1964. They wrote the date down here that they were changed. I thought that was pretty cool, because these are not the original ones. And when he did it, he wired them backwards and couldn't get the TV to work, and maybe that's why it possibly sat somewhere in a closet all these years until it finally fell into my hands. I don't know. But anyway, I decided to get a hold of Brendan and ask him. And I said, Brendan, I sent him a video. I showed him where everything was wired and how it was wired. And I said, what's going on here? I said, should I reverse all this stuff and, you know, 
when I put the, the I'm going to replace these two with selenium or, uh, or with the silicon diodes. And he wrote back, and this is what he said. Just a few more feet. Come on, Songbird. If we can just clear this ridge. But there's nothing but mums. There's a shallow lake just the other side of this ridge. It may be dry enough to make a landing. It's our only chance. There goes one. He said, John, uh, you know, the symbol for a selenium rectifier is exactly the same as a symbol for a silicon diode on a schematic. Uh, this being the anode, anode, cathode, cathode, that line right there. He said, the problem is the difference between the two is that the polarity symbols are the opposite. For instance, the anode is negative and the cathode is positive on a selenium rectifier. It's marked that way. On a silicon diode, the cathode is negative and the anode is positive. Just the opposite. And he said the reason that the selenium rectifiers showed a positive sign on the cathode end was because that's the end that faced the B plus in the radial. So when they first developed these things they decided to go ahead and make that positive on this end because it faced that B plus. And I said, well I didn't know that. <laughs> well now I do and now so do you. Everybody out there knows that the selenium rectifier, uh, positive and negative symbols are opposite that of a silicon diode. Remember, you heard it here. What happens now? Feather the prop to reduce drag. We'll fly in one engine. There goes the other one. That does it. Now keep in mind that the selenium rectifiers and the silicon diodes that I'm going to replace them with, they both operate the same. They're operational characteristics except for certain values, you know, how many amps or how many volts one can take versus the other. But the operational characteristics are the same. They both have anodes and they both have cathodes. It was just the way they were labeled at the factory, the way they were painted on there. They put a plus sign on here, which is the cathode side of the selenium rectifiers whereas today it's a negative so they still have to go in the circuit the silicon diodes that we're going to be replacing these with still have to be put in the circuit the same way they appear on the schematic anodes there cathodes there and there just remember which end is which because the way they painted them on just painted it at the factory is 180 out from the way it is today. I hope all that makes sense. There's the lake! And it looks dry enough! Can we get there? Looks like about two miles. The Songbird has a 4 to 1 glide ratio. It's going to be awful close. Well, that's about it for today. I want you, I'll be spending the next couple days before I head off to Missouri uh, cleaning up the chassis. I've already done a little bit. That's copper plating underneath there. It's really interesting. But this, this I think is cadmium on top. It's very powdery and it's just, there's no way, I don't think it'll hold a good primer and a good paint. We're going to be painting this one with the epoxy appliance paint also because this, this stuff is so powdery. And uh, it, it's coming off real easy. You know, you can see I've got the front all the way down. Just put a little bit of navy, navel jelly on it with a Q-tip. And just a couple of seconds later, uh, just wipe it off. There's virtually no rust here because of all this copper. And uh, so that's what I'll be working on over the next couple days. We'll see everybody after I get back from Missouri next week.